Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. A series of study from the Holy Scriptures based on the book of Revelation by Mark Finley. Join us as we follow the vital topics that will be presented on this study, understanding God's messages and warnings on this last days of Earth's history. Jesus Christ and in time prophecies from the book of Revelation. What does the future hold? Where can we find certainty in a world of uncertainty? The Book of Revelation provides hopeful answers for today, tomorrow, and forever. Join Mark Finley, author and world-renowned speaker, on a journey into the future with Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. Welcome again to Revelation's Ancient Discoveries. I'm glad you've joined us. We've been on a journey through the book of Revelation, and this presentation focuses especially on Jesus and the book of Revelation. When many people think of Revelation, they think of cryptic symbols. They think of strange beasts. They think of prophetic images. But yet Jesus is the center of the book of Revelation. Now, of course, in this series, we will discuss these various prophetic symbols in their meaning. They're vitally important. But if you understand the prophetic symbols and you leave out Jesus, you've missed the heart of the book. So let's pray together as we go into this presentation. Father in heaven, as we open the word of God again, as we look at the book of Revelation, come be with us. May this be more than an exercise to satisfy our curiosity but may it be a powerful, life-changing presentation for each of us, in Christ's name, amen. Our topic for this presentation is Revelation's Peacemaker. You know, the world we live in is a world that is filled with incredible stress. People seem to be rushed, hurried, stressed out much of the time. And as the result of that, scores of people are experiencing health problems. Stress is one of the major causes of coronary heart disease. How much stress is too much? The researchers at a large Eastern University wanted to find the answer to that question. And so they took a lamb and they put that lamb in a pen. And in the lamb's feeding pen, they put 10 stations. They hooked up a electrode to each one of these stations. Now the researchers could observe what the lamb was doing and the lamb couldn't see out of the pen. So the lamb would go over to one feeding station and the researchers would press a button, shock the lamb. They wanted to find out how much stress this lamb could take. Now what do you think happened when the lamb was shocked? Of course the lamb jumped and ran. The researchers were surprised. The lamb never went back to the feeding station where it was shocked. The researchers kept shocking that poor little lamb at every feeding station. And the lamb was shocked again and again. Now the shocks weren't strong enough to kill the lamb, just strong enough to stress out the lamb. And the lamb would never go back to the feeding station where it was shocked. Feeding station number three, shock. Feeding station number six, shock. Pretty soon the lamb was shocked at every feeding station. The lamb ran to the center of the pen and just began shaking and shaking and shaking. The lamb died of a heart attack, nervous breakdown. The amount of stress was just so great, the lamb couldn't take it any longer. Then the researchers did something quite amazing. They put that lamb's twin in the pen with its mother. And as they did, the lamb went over to the feeding station, that little lamb, and began to eat. They shocked it. The lamb turned and looked to its mother, ran over to its mother, and the mother said something in the lamb's ear that they were not sure of what that lamb language was all about. And they wondered, what's going on here? What's this little lamb gonna do? The lamb ran then to the next feeding station and ate. They shocked it. Mother looked at lamb, lamb looked at mother. The shock wasn't that bad. Lamb went baba, mother lamb went baba, and the lamb kept eating. The researchers were amazed. The presence of the mother in the pen made all the difference. This little lamb had some place to run. 
This little lamb had a place of security. This little lamb had a place of refuge. And the stressors did not bother the lamb any longer. Is there a place that you can run in the stresses of your life? Who can bear our burdens? Who can carry our load? In the book of Revelation, deeply within the heart of scripture, in the last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is the center theme. He is the one that can bear our burdens. He is the one that can lift the heavy load. He is the one that can enable us to handle the stressors of life. Now remember, Revelation 1 verse 1, our theme, this book of Revelation is the revelation of who, everybody? Who's it the revelation of? That's right. We've mentioned it again and again and again. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Throughout the book of Revelation, Jesus has very many different names or titles. Revelation 1 verse 5, Jesus is the faithful witness. He witnesses of the Father's love. He witnesses of the Father's grace. He witnesses of the Father's glory. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. He was resurrected from the dead. Christ came out of the tomb alive. He lived, he died, he lives again. The Bible says that Jesus is ruler over all the kings of the earth. This earth is not in the hands of human beings. This earth is in the hands of God. So titles of Christ, what are those titles? Throughout the book of Revelation, the faithful witness of the Father's love, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of all the earth. In Revelation chapter 12, verse five, Jesus is the male child that's to rule all nations with the rod of iron. He is the one who has supreme authority. In Revelation chapter 12, 12 verse 5 he is the child caught up to God in the father's throne the resurrected Christ throughout the book of Revelation Jesus is front and center we see him again and again in Revelation 14 Jesus is the one who comes to reap the harvest of the earth in Revelation 14 14 the Bible puts it this way that I looked and behold, a white cloud, and one sat on the cloud, one like the Son of Man. Here is Christ, the one who was here once, that walked the dusty streets of the Galilee, the one that forgave and healed and delivered demoniacs. That Jesus, he is the Son of Man. He's coming again, coming in the clouds of heaven, coming in the imagery of Revelation to reap the harvest of the earth. The text goes on. He has on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. What is this symbol of about Jesus? It's about this Christ. This Christ who reigns over the kings of the earth. This Christ who's triumphant over the powers of hell. What is this book of Revelation all about? This Christ who comes one day triumphantly to reap the harvest of the entire earth. In Revelation chapter 19, Jesus comes as the conquering king, comes riding on a symbolic white horse. And you remember Revelation 19 says, he is the king of kings, he is the Lord of lords. You remember the great hallelujah chorus, Handel's Messiah, king of kings, Lord of lords. That's who Jesus is in Revelation, throughout the book of Revelation. Christ is mentioned as the lion, kingly authority, the lamb, sacrifice. There is no book in the Bible that has more symbolism of Jesus than this book, the book of Revelation. But the key symbol in Revelation is the symbol of a lamb. This symbol of a lamb is mentioned 27 times. Christ's kingly authority comes because he was the Lamb of God. And so in this presentation, let's explore that symbolism of a lamb. What does this symbolism of a lamb mean to you? What does this symbolism of a lamb mean to me? And how does this symbolism of a lamb impact our lives today? How does it change our lives? Revelation chapter five, there verse six, I looked and behold in the midst of a throne stood a lamb as it had been slain. John looks up into heaven and he sees this imagery of a lamb. Revelation 5 talks about the fact that there's only one that can provide salvation for the human race and the whole universe sings, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive glory and honor and power. 
In Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world before sin ever began. When God gave to the human race the capacity to choose, knowing that the human race can make the wrong choice, God put into motion a plan that would deal with the sin of Adam and Eve. God's foreknowledge foresaw what would happen, yet he created the human race with freedom of will, and he provided a sacrifice, a one who would come, the Lamb of God, to be sacrificed for the human race. Revelation chapter 12 talks about a dragon-like beast that would attack the lamb and make war with the followers of the lamb. But again, the lamb, Jesus Christ, is triumphant. Again, the lamb, Jesus Christ, is conqueror. Again, the lamb, Jesus Christ, defeats and crushes all evil. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. What was it about the blood of the lamb that enabled these followers of Christ in the early centuries to be able to be conquerors and triumphant? How do we understand this expression, the blood of the lamb? It's kind of foreign to modern 21st century ears. What does it mean? We're gonna explore that and why this symbolism of a lamb is so significant. Throughout the book of Revelation, one thing that kind of startles you is a lamb and a dragon fight. If a lamb and dragon fight, who do you think is gonna win? Obviously, the dragon. Not so, book of Revelation turns that on, our head, on its head. Revelation, the 17th chapter, the 14th verse says, these will make war with the lamb. It's talking about a great confederacy at end time. And the lamb will overcome them. The lamb overcomes all the powers of evil at the end. There's something about the blood of the lamb. Something about the blood of the lamb that enables God's plan to triumph over the principalities and powers of hell in the universe. Why? For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So the lamb triumphs over the dragon, and the lamb becomes King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, how can we understand in 20th century terms what this blood of the lamb means? We're gonna go back throughout the Old Testament and try to discover the significance of that. Be prepared for some surprises because tonight God's gonna to speak to you. In this presentation, God's gonna to touch your heart. In this presentation, you're gonna discover why this imagery of the blood of the lamb is so significant. You will find forgiveness. You'll find freedom from guilt. You'll find a new power in your life. And you will find that the greatest power in the universe is love. And this whole imagery of the blood of the lamb speaks of love. The love of a God that would not let you go. The love of a God that will follow you wherever you go. The love of God that will touch your life and change your life and transform your life. Satan has tried to dominate the universe in the great controversy between good and evil by lies, deception, and force. Jesus dominates by one thing, and he dominates by love. That's the significance of this symbolism. Now you remember, God creates Adam and Eve. He creates them perfect. He creates them with no flaw. He creates them in his own image, the Bible says. And he creates Adam and Eve with the power of choice, with the capacity to choose between good and evil. Eve goes to the tree. Satan says to her, has God really said that you can't eat of this tree? When you eat of it, you'll become as gods, knowing good and evil. The controversy wages on earth. That controversy that we studied about in Revelation that waged in heaven wages on earth. Eve and her husband Adam are caught in a titanic struggle. They're caught with a choice. God said you shall not eat. Disobeying God. They partake of that fruit of the tree of good and evil. And immediately, evil and wickedness and sin come into their bodies. They're separated from God. Does God push this planet out into space 
and simply annihilate it and let selfishness reign and let the entire human race be destroyed? Does God simply swat and destroy evil like swatting a mosquito? Does God simply destroy Adam and Eve and say, okay, you've sinned, the wage of sin is death, I'm gonna start all over again? God does not do that at all. God develops a plan, a plan that would deal with the sin problem because sin develops a major problem and this is what the text says. The wages of sin, can you say it with me? You may know the text. Romans chapter six, verse 23. The wages of sin is what? Death. Why is sin's wage death? Because sin separates us from God. God is the source of life. So to be separated from God is to be separated from the source of life. Therefore, death ensues. If you have an apple tree and you break a branch off of the apple tree, the sap in the branch may cause the leaves still to be green and may cause the apple still to be there on that branch. But you come back a day later, two days later, five days later, pretty soon you see that branch separated from the tree dying and decay. Exact same thing with sin. Sin separates us from the source of life. Sin separates us from God and death ensues in our bodies. Now, how do you deal with the problem of death? That's where the lamb comes in. Leviticus 17 verse 11. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now the blood represents life. When the life of Jesus is poured out on the cross, his life atones for Adam's sin. Down through the Old Testament, the symbolism of a lamb and the symbolism of a dying lamb represents the dying Christ. Blood represents life. The blood of the lamb shed throughout the Old Testament represents the life of the sinner that must die, not simply a physical death, but an eternal death because of sin, unless there is a substitute. So throughout the Old Testament, men and women who sinned brought lambs. Why? Leviticus 17 verse 11, the life of the flesh is where? In the blood. The dying lamb represents the dying of Christ. Throughout the Old Testament, God instructed his people to bring animal sacrifices. Now you say, that's terrible. That's terrible that all these sacrifices, all this blood had to be shed. It's terrible because the lamb didn't do anything. It is terrible. Sin brings its consequences. Sin brings death. But there's something more terrible than the death of a lamb. And that's the death of Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God. Sin has its wages, and those wages are death. And all of heaven was willing to pay that wage for the human race. So let's go to the Old Testament sanctuary and see if we can learn some lessons that apply to our lives about this dying lamb. Here's a man that gets in a big argument with his neighbor. And the argument is over a land dispute. And so the man begins yelling and screaming at his neighbor. And as this man is yelling, as he's screaming at his neighbor, he slaps his neighbor across the face. That night, as this man goes back to his tent in ancient Israel, he begins to think of what he's done. He begins to think of his sin. He kneels down before God and he says, God, I've sinned. My anger got the best of me, I slapped my neighbor. Not only must he go to his neighbor and ask for forgiveness, but he has to bring a lamb. And he brings a lamb here to the sanctuary. As he enters the sanctuary with the lamb, he's met by the priest. He comes to that sanctuary with his lamb and he places his hands over the head of the lamb. Not simply over the head of the lamb, but on the head of the lamb. The full weight of that man's body is on the head of that lamb. And then this man must take the knife and he must come to that lamb as he's placing his hands on the head of the lamb. As that lamb is against his knee, that man must take the knife and he must slit the throat of the lamb. 
as he confesses his sin over the head of the lamb. The guilt of the sin is transferred from the man to the lamb. You say the lamb didn't do anything. The lamb didn't sin. In fact, the Bible says you bring a lamb without spot or blemish. Now, there were multiple offerings in the sanctuary. They could bring a bullock. They could bring a lamb. Depending on the sin and depending on the nature of the individual. You know, actually, very poor people at times brought grain offerings. There was a perpetual sacrifice of blood offered for them at the sanctuary. But the provisions of the sanctuary for all humanity, whoever you are, you can come. Whoever you are, you can find grace. Whoever you are, you can find mercy. So the person has to slit the throat of the lamb there at the altar in the court. Once that lamb is slain in the court, the part of the blood is poured out at the basin of that altar of sacrifice. But the priest took the blood into the sanctuary and sprinkled it before the veil behind which was the Ark of the Covenant or the law of God. Now notice how Leviticus puts it, Leviticus chapter five, and you're looking there at verse five and six. And it shall be when he's guilty in any of these things. Now notice the last part of the text, very interesting. That he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. So if it was a lie, he had to confess that. If it was anger, he had to confess that. If it was selfishness or greed, whatever that sin was. So sin was very, very specifically confessed. Too many times Christians get on their knees and say, oh Jesus, if I sin today, please forgive me. That kind of general confession, which is really not confession, it's really self-justification, that general confession does not bring the peace to the soul. It does not bring joy to the heart. It does not bring deliverance from guilt. But when you and I get on our knees and before God barefacedly repent and say, God, today I was selfish. God, today I was less than honest. God, today pride filled my heart. Jesus, I know you are my lamb. That makes all the difference. So the sinner must bring the lamb. He must take his knife. Notice what it says. He shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord for his sin which he has committed. Every lamb pointed forward to the coming of Christ, the divine lamb of God. You remember what John the Baptist said in John 1 verse 29? He saw Jesus coming and he said, behold the lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Your sin can be taken away. Your sin can be forgiven. Provision through Christ has been made for that. The Bible is very clear. Why did God require these sacrifices? The Bible is very plain. Hebrews chapter nine, verse 11 and 12. But Christ came as high priest of good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands that is not of this creation. So the tabernacle of Christ in heaven was foreshadowed with the earthly tabernacle. You see, in the book of Hebrews, you have three major themes. First, Christ is better. Christ is better and his sacrifice is better than earthly sacrifices. Secondly, the priesthood of Christ is better than the priesthood of earthly priests. And thirdly, the sanctuary of Christ in heaven is better than the earthly sanctuary. So all of Hebrews is about Christ is better. But we see in the Old Testament clearly the outline of this plan of salvation that would be manifest in Christ when he came centuries later. So this text says, and it goes on to say, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Jesus, once for all, after his sacrifice on the cross, ascended to heaven. And he says, as we come seeking forgiveness, as we come seeking grace, as we come seeking freedom from guilt, Jesus says, this man, this woman is one of mine. He writes pardon after our name. Why? Because his blood was shed. It is not the blood of lambs, the blood of bulls and goats that provides forgiveness for sin. That simply foreshadowed that simply kept people focused if they knew or understand. The Bible says in Hebrews 9 verse 28, 
Can you read it from the screen with me, wherever you are, maybe in your home, and maybe with friends? Let's read it together. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, just like the sinner confessed their sin. The guilt is transferred from to the lamb. The lamb dies not in behalf of the sinner, but as a symbol of Christ who would die in behalf of the sinner. Now let me ask you this. Where was the sin before the sinner confessed it? Who had it? When the sin is coming with the lamb by his side to his sanctuary, who has the sin? That's right, the sinner has it. Is the sinner guilty? Certainly. Is the sinner burdened with guilt? Definitely. Now, once the sinner confesses the sin and it's transferred to the lamb, who has it now? You say the lamb, right. Isn't that why the lamb had to die? Because there was a transference of guilt from the man to the lamb? When the man walks away from the sanctuary, what kind of feelings do you think he has? He's filled with joy, why? Because the sin is transferred to the lamb, the blood of the lamb is shed, that blood with the record of that sin goes into the sanctuary. Who does not have the guilt now? The man doesn't, he's, he's singing, he's filled with praise, he's been forgiven. Let me ask you this question. Why are you still bearing guilt? You confessed your sin to Jesus. Why are you still carrying that load of guilt around? Why do you still feel that emptiness in your soul? If you have confessed your sin to Jesus, you no longer need to carry that guilt. That's what the blood of the lamb is all about. We confess our sin and that guilt is gone. We don't have to bear that sin any longer. Many people are on antidepressants often because they are so guilty for because of what they've done. Now, I don't mean that's the only reason, but it is one reason. Guilty about their past, guilty about their failures, guilty about the things they should have done. There is a fountain filled with blood that's drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Once we come to Jesus, that guilt in Christ is gone. Once we come in our imagination with our lamb to the sanctuary, and once we kneel and confess our sins at the foot of Calvary's cross, the guilt is taken from us. It is placed on our Savior and Lord and our Redeemer. We need not bear that guilt anymore. We are free, we are free, we are free in Jesus Christ. That's good news for somebody tonight. That's good news for somebody watching this program tonight. This very moment that you're watching this program, as I speak, in your mind you can say, Jesus, I'm sorry. Jesus, I failed you. Jesus, I let you down. Jesus, I disappointed your heart, but your eternal love would not let me go. Your eternal love came and lived the perfect life I should have lived and died the death that I should have died. And Lord, I come to you to receive that grace, to receive that mercy. You see, every lamb or sacrifice pointed forward to that one eternal sacrifice, the lamb of God that would die for our sins. Now to be free from guilt, you first have to acknowledge it. You know, there are many people that even when they're trying to have reconciliation with another person, they'll say something like this. You know, if I did anything to hurt you, please forgive me. Once you start with if, it's not a confession at all. Well, if I've offended you, oh God, if God I sinned today, please forgive me. Drop your ifs, get rid of the ifs. Simply come to God and acknowledge your guilt. But somebody says, that, 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 that make, make me feel um, uncomfortable. 
Bless your heart. Whether you feel uncomfortable or not is not the issue. You could feel more uncomfortable if you don't confess. You could feel more guilty if you don't confess. In bare-faced repentance, come to God. Because, you know, you're never going to be free from that guilt. You're never going to be free from that, those condemning voices in your brain unless you acknowledge that you failed, unless you really clearly acknowledge that you're guilt. And once you acknowledge that, once you acknowledge that, then you can receive the gift of God and eternal life in Christ. Because look, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. You remember we read the first part of it earlier? It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can never receive the gift unless you acknowledge the sin. I was speaking in the Philippines, way up outside of Legaspi City. It was up in like a jungle area. It was on an old dirt road, and we put up a wooden table and set up a lantern called the villagers, and they were sitting on the road, and I was talking about Jesus, talking about the gift of salvation. And I really wanted them to understand the gift of salvation. And it seemed everything I was saying, they have this blank look on their faces. And I had something in my pocket. I don't remember now whether it was a comb or a pen. Let's say it was a pen, a real nice pen. And I said, I need to offer this to them as a gift. Maybe they'll understand the gift of salvation. Took the pen out of my pocket, a lot of little kids sitting there. I said, here's something for you. You want it? Now, they saw this big, tall American coming and these little, tiny Filipino children. One boy got up and I came to him. I said, do you want this? He was so shy, he jumped up and ran back into the jungle. Went to another boy. Hey, do you want this pen? Jumped up and ran into the jungle. Went up to another boy. You want this pen? He grabbed it out of my hand and ran. And pretty soon, the elders of the village said, come back, come back, come back. So all the kids came back. They gathered around me. And I said, now, to the first boy, do you have the pen? No, I don't have it, sir. I said to the next one, do you have the pen? No, I don't have it, sir. I said to the next one, do you have the pen? He kind of sheepishly pulls it out of his pocket. I have the pen. I said to the other two, why does he have it and you don't? They said, well, because he took it. I said, you can have it. He can have that? It's a gift? He can have it. Why don't you have it, boy? I didn't take it. You can have the gift of salvation. Reach out and take it. Reach out and say, Jesus, I acknowledge my guilt. Jesus' salvation is a gift. It's not something I can earn. Well, well, well Pastor Mark, I, I'm going to become a Christian, and I'm going to go to church, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to be faithful in my offerings, and then can I have the gift of salvation? The Bible says, no, you can have it right now. We do not do good works in order to be saved. We do good works because we are saved. We've come to Christ and we've seen his love and his grace and it has changed our lives. If we come to Jesus and confess our sin, the burden of guilt is rolled away. The burden of guilt is gone. We no longer are seized with that guilt that crushes out the very joy of our life. Look what Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 says. How much more then shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself to God without spot or without blemish. The scripture is so plain. How much more shall the blood of Christ if the blood of bulls and goats foreshadowed Christ. When we meet the fulfillment, the one who all the shadows of the Old Testament point forward to, we come to him and our life is changed. It says he can cleanse your conscience from, good, from dead works to serve the living God. Do you want your conscience clean? There's many a man, many a woman that would pay Hundreds of dollars to a counselor to get their conscience clean, to get their head straight. Jesus Christ can straighten out your head. He can give you a clean conscience. You can find in Christ the longing of your heart. The guilt, the shame, the condemnation can be gone in this living Christ. Jesus can take away everything that guilt produces, the fear, 
the anxiety, the stress, the sickness. It is gone in Christ. We no longer need to handle that. This is the message of Scripture and specifically the message of the book of Revelation. 27 times in the book of Revelation, Jesus is mentioned as the Lamb, the Lamb of God that takes away our sin, the Lamb of God who reaches out in love to us, the Lamb of God who forgives us, the blood of Christ that changes us, this Lamb that will triumph through love over the principalities and powers of darkness. This lamb who will triumph through love over the oppressive forces of evil. This lamb who will triumph through love over everything that Satan throws at us, the lamb and the dragon fight. Now there's only one who can take away our guilt. There's only one who can take away our shame and that is Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. One of the most amazing passages in all of scripture. For he, that is God, made him that who is Christ, who knew no sin. Did Jesus ever sin? Never. He knew no sin. To become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became sin for us. All of the guilt, all of the shame, all of the condemnation, all of the horrible nature of sin was placed upon Christ on the cross. Now remember, the wages of sin is what, everybody? The wages of sin is death. Is that physical death or eternal death? See, if the wages of sin is only physical death, then you can live beyond eternally. So the wages of sin must not only be physical death, the consequence of sin is physical death but the ultimate wage of sin or the wages of sin, that's eternal death. That means you go into the grave and never ever come out. So when Christ hung on the cross, he bore the condemnation of sin. And that's why when he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That the whole sin problem was weighing on his back in the great controversy between good and evil. And although Jesus said, destroy this body, in three days I'll raise it up again. When he hung on the cross, he, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, would taste death for every man. He could not see himself coming through the portals of the tomb. That's why at the end of his life, he made that statement of faith, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He had to trust God completely for the resurrection. But all around him was sin and shame and death. And when Jesus hangs on that cross bearing the sins of humanity, watch this point, don't miss this point, Jesus himself was willing because of love to go into the grave and never, ever, ever come out if that was necessary to pay the wages of sin for you and me. It was like Jesus was saying this, I am willing to go into the grave and be there forever and ever and ever. Be separated from my Father forever if that's what it takes to save the human race. There is nothing like this in any other religion in the world. There's nothing like this in Hinduism. There's nothing like this in Islam. There's nothing like this in Shintoism. There's nothing like this in Confucianism. There is nothing like this in any religion of the world except Christianity. See, all religions say that human beings have failed and they need to get back to God. And so most of them say you do that by good works, you do that by performing works of charity, you do that by being kind, but Christianity says that Christ came and he lived the perfect life we should have lived. He died the death on the cross, paying the ransom price for our sin. He died that death bearing all the guilt and shame of our sin. He was willing to go into the grave, be separated from the Father forever and ever, if that's what it took to save you and to save me. The glory of the cross is the glory of a love that would never, ever, ever let us go. That's why Jesus cried out in Matthew 27, verse 46, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, he could not see the Father's face. He did not recognize the Father's love. It was not that he had the feeling that his Father was there embracing him. Sin was so evil, sin was so wicked, sin was so horrible. It was like Jesus' heart was ripped apart from the Father. Why did he stay there? It wasn't the physical pain in the nails through his hands. That was excruciatingly agonizing. It wasn't the crown of thorns upon his head. It wasn't the horror, the physical crucifixion. 
It wasn't the emotional sense of being betrayed. It was this sense that his heart was ripped out from the Father. Therefore, he hung in love for you and me. And all I can do is fall at his feet and worship him. All I can do is praise the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world because Jesus on that cross bore the corporate, consolidated, focused guilt of all humanity, of every sin that was ever committed. He bore that shame. He bore the pain, the suffering, the death of that sin that all humanity should have borne in their own bodies through eternal death. Jesus bore that agony. And that's why scripture says in Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are saved by grace through faith. You can reach out and say, Jesus, thank you so much. Wouldn't it be a shame to turn our backs on that grace? Wouldn't it be a shame to walk away from that love? Wouldn't it be a shame to crucify him again and bring pain to his heart by denying what he has done for us on the cross of Calvary. We can come and say, Lord, give me the gift of salvation. I come with an open heart. I come to the cross. I come believing that Jesus is my lamb. That's the message of Revelation, the message that you can come the Bible says in 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19, you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and the shedding of his blood speaks to us of love. A love that is so strong that he would go for you into that grave. A love that reaches out to you this very moment. But somebody says, Pastor Mark, make it plain, make it simple. I, I want to know tonight. I want to know that I have eternal life through Jesus Christ. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to know that I am Christ. Can you make it plain? Let me give you five simple steps to receive the gift of salvation and eternal life. Here's the fact. Number one, accept the fact that God loves you. No matter what you feel about yourself, God doesn't feel that way about you. Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. First, accept the fact that God loves you. Jeremiah 31 3 says, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. You've not turned on this presentation by accident. You've not watching 3ABN by chance tonight. God's love has drawn you here. He loves you more than you ever know and he loves you more than you'll ever realize. So fact number one, step number one of salvation, accept the fact that God loves you. Step number two, recognize that you cannot save yourself. All your good works are not gonna save you because one sin is worthy of eternal death and the wages of sin is death. So all of us are sinners. We all are in the same boat. We all have a disease that's fatal, but the divine physician has a cure. Accept the fact that God loves you and wants to save you recognize that you cannot save yourself. Romans 3, verse 23 and 24 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified, what's the next word? What is it, everybody? Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. We cannot save ourselves, but he can save us. Number three, believe that Jesus can and will save you. Now, don't only believe Jesus can save you. I've met a lot of people that have given lectures all over the world, and they say, oh, I believe Jesus can save me. Do you believe he will save you? There's a difference. Grasp by faith that there's nothing more important to Christ than your salvation. Grasp by faith that Jesus is heaven's best gift given by the Father to save you. Accept by faith that God will send every angel in heaven to beat back the powers of hell in your life if you'll let him. Accept by faith that God will fill your life with his Holy Spirit, reveal to you through his word his love. Believe that not only Jesus can, but Jesus will save you. For God, if you know it, wherever you are, say it with me. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish 
but have everlasting life. Now notice what the text says. God so loved this, the world that he gave his only begotten son. God gave because he wanted to redeem that whoever, the Bible does not say a rich man, a poor man, it says whoever believes in him. Confess your sins to Jesus and believe you're forgiven. Once we come to Christ and know that he desires to save us, come confessing. Scripture says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to do what? To forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we do the confessing, he will do the forgiving. So come, come with your lamb Jesus. Believe that God loves you. Accept the fact that you're a sinner, that without him you can't be saved. Believe that not only does he want to save you, but believe he will save you. Come confessing. And as you confess, claim his gift of eternal life and decide to serve him forever. See, once we confess our sins, the living Christ enters our life. And you know, once we confess our sins, we then can serve him forever. Let me introduce you to this Christ. Let me introduce you to some people who've met this Christ. Come with me on a journey and meet a woman cast at his feet in adultery. Let her give your, the testimony to you this day. What does she say with a brightness in her eyes? Now she's no longer condemned, she is forgiven. Jesus, can you forgive sin? Mary says, yes, I was caught in adultery, the very act, but I came to Jesus, come meet this Christ who touches the eyes of the blind that are open and they receive new life in Christ. Listen to the testimony of men and women throughout the New Testament. Look at the boys and girls that sit on his lap and find in him such acceptance, such grace, such mercy, such love. Come with me when he breaks the bread on the mountainside and the hillside of the Galilee and look at 5,000 people whose physical needs are met, but not only that, they accept him as the bread of life and they want to make him king. Come and meet this Jesus. He walks through the valleys of Galilee. He walks the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem. He forgives, he changes, he heals, he transforms. This is the Christ of the book of Revelation. Come meet this Christ when the crowds gather round him and sing Hosanna, Hosanna to his name. Come meet this Christ. He is not some mythical figure like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. He is the living Christ. He walked and talked and lived and breathed. He healed and forgave and empowered and delivered demoniacs. He is the Lamb of God. Come meet this Christ. As he gives a woman and back her son again. He cares, he loves. You say, what's God like? Look at Jesus. Look at Jesus in the New Testament and see this Christ walking among men and women and transforming their lives. Look at this Christ. Watch him as a crown of thorns is jammed upon his head. Look at the blood running down his face. Why does he suffer the agony? Watch with me as the divine son of God is beaten is whipped, is flagellated. Watch the blood running down his back. Why does he go through that? The one worshiped by all the angels. The one at whose very name, angels saying praise and praise and praise. The one that's existed with the Father from all eternity. Why does he suffer so? Come with me. As they stretch out his hands and nail him to a cross, watch as strong-armed Roman soldiers drive those nails through his hands and feet. Why does he suffer so? Come with me. Come with me to that cross and see him hanging there, bearing the sins of all humanity. Why is he doing it? Because you are too precious. Because you are too valuable. Because he does not want to live in heaven without you. Heaven's not worth it for him if you're not there. And so he hangs there, bearing all the sin of humanity. He hangs there on that cross. For God so loved the world that what did he do? He gave. What did he give? His only begotten son. That whoever, whoever means you, whoever means me, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Come with me for a moment 
to the very heart of Africa. I traveled to Rwanda shortly after the genocide. Thousands of people were killed in a very short period of time, in about six months of time, actually. My host, brother Eman Rutalinga, shared with me the story that during the genocide, his wife, children, and grandchildren were killed. It was a terrible battle between the Hutus and the Tutsis, and people were slain simply because they were part of one particular tribe. It was a horrible time for the nation. Bodies were stacked up in the streets, dogs ate them, bodies were thrown in the river, blood-stained rivers. As I talked to Brother Rutalinga, he said to me, I want you to meet a woman, and when you meet that woman, it'll change your life. Her name is Mrs. Selfu. We got in a little pickup truck and drove out over dirt roads. We drove out to a little African village. Pastor Rutalinga gave me the background of her story. She was with her husband when he was murdered. The killers were coming, slaying Tutsis in each village. And as they came through those villages, one person, another person, another person, another person was slain. The blood was flowing in the streets. The villagers were killed, died. Mrs. Selfo and her husband, who happened to be a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, fled with a number of other people, about 60 of them, into a church. They thought that if they were in that church, it might be a sanctuary. It might be a place where they could hide. They were in the church. The killers came in. They began to kill people left and right. People were screaming. Some were trying to get away. Mrs. Selfo was holding the hand of her husband as she did. The killer came over he, with a machete, struck her husband in the head, split his head open. Blood was everywhere, spilling over Mrs. Selfu. Her husband died instantly in her arms. Then the killer took his machete, a young man, about 21, and hit her in the head, split her head, hit her in the, in the arm, split her arm. And as she fell over, he thought she was dead. Her body lay among the dead bodies for three days. After those three days, villagers came to bury the townspeople that had died. And as they were burying them, somebody took her pulse and said, this, this woman is still alive. This woman is still alive. They took her to the hospital and nursed her for three months back to health. When she was well, she began thinking, I can be a bitter angry old woman or or I can accept the fact that Jesus Christ has saved me that Jesus Christ has forgiven me that his grace is mine I can reach out to others she began going to the prison she began ministering to the prisoners the killers because by now the genocide was over there were 17 prisons or thereabouts built 180,000 prisoners were placed in that prison those prisons those many prisons they were killers murderers she began ministering to them one day in that prison she met the man that had killed her husband the man that put that terrible scar on her head she reached out in grace to him he found forgiveness he found Christ Finally, he was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then she said to me as I talked to her that day, do you want to meet him? Because he was let out of prison. And Pastor Mark, he's accepted God's grace. And I've adopted him as my son. He accepted the invitation of Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And whoever thirsts, let him take of the water of life freely whoever you are you can receive God's grace whoever you are looking for purpose and meaning you can say I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold I'd rather have him than riches untold he speaks to you of his love and grace right now why not bow your head and accept him as Celestine sings
I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches and told. I'd rather have Jesus than have. Than anything this world affords today. I'd rather have Jesus than man's applause. I'd rather be. Faithful to his dear cause, I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast. Help Jesus than anything this world affords today. I'd rather help Jesus. Is that your desire? An African woman reached out to a young man that killed her own husband. She reached out in love and in grace and in forgiveness and mercy. And she adopted that young man as her son. Jesus reaches out to you right now. Whatever you have done, his love embraces you. You can come forgiving, asking him for forgiveness. You can come asking him for grace. You can come asking him for mercy. You can come and be a new man or a new woman right now as we pray. Father in heaven, we come opening our hearts to the love of Christ. We come accepting his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his power in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us for Revelations Ancient Discoveries.